Uh, I'm Grant Schofield. Guys, Dan Plews. And we're here to talk about Endure IQ and Long Distance Triathlon 101 Nutrition. Yeah, 101 Nutrition. So it's been a, a lot of thinking in the background and it's good to finally start talking about it properly. So Dan, you're, you're one of the world's leading exercise scientists. You're now the age group world champion at Kona. Uh, you've set the course record. Uh, what role does nutrition have to play in that? Um, well, I guess my journey started in 2012. Um, 2012 when I was at the Olympics actually. I was at the Olympics with the New Zealand rowing team at the time. And it was at the time when uh, Tim Noakes started talking a lot about and he pretty much revoked his his nutritional advice from his infamous book, The World Running. And um, you know, and he said, that, you know, maybe we, maybe we need to start looking at, this, looking at this a bit differently. Is this high carbohydrate diet the way forward? And, and, I, and, when, and generally when Tim Noakes says something, I'm like, oh, you know, it's someone that I really respect and, and just lots of his ideas around sport and training. I really, I really think he has some great thoughts and so I thought I'll just give it a try. And so you've been, you've been a triathlete up until this point, you've been competing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Tell us about that. So I, I, I started competing at the age of nine pretty much. Um, so nine years old, did my first swim run event. Um, and then went through the went through the ranks. Um, was a very good junior and youth um, national British national youth champion, British national junior champion. But I never kind of really made that step up. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know why. And I, and, I, and I do know that like during my university years, I just really struggled to. I just really struggled with the training. I never really seemed to adapt. I was always struggling to make race weight. I was always a little, a little bit heavier than my peers. And, and you were a high carb athlete. And I was, oh, Totally high carb, yeah, massively high carb. Like, and when I think back about back on it now, it's this almost makes me it just makes me sick with the amount of carbs I, I would I would eat. Like, so 2012, you started changing things up, and you, you went for this low carb, healthy fat yep. approach. Yep. And you were competing at that stage as well. Yeah. So I, I back then I was I was always reasonable, and like people will probably be listening to us now, and they'll be like, yeah, but you know, this is you know, he, he was already good. But I was around like a. 410 half Ironman kind of person, you know, I was regularly around the 410, but not much more than that. And you know, that was when I, that's when I made the shift. Yep, yeah. And you hadn't done an Ironman at that stage. Hadn't done an Ironman at that stage, but I've done a lot of 70.3s. First Ironman? First Ironman 2013, 922. No. Pretty, pretty handy first ever. Pretty you? handy first ever, but it wasn't, I can't say I enjoyed it that much. Like, my, I remember looking at my watch and um, I was thinking, it, it felt like I was running about four hour marathon, to be honest with you. <laughs> <laughs> but then I was about a three twenty two, but but at the time it felt much worse than that. And you progressively developed this this uh, low carb approach. You call it train low, race high. Yeah. And really successively improved across a number of Ironmans. Yeah. And got better and better and better, and started setting course records and world records. Yeah. And, and world championships. Tell us about that journey. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's just been progressive, little bits here and there, and gradually. I guess I've honed my diet, I've honed my techniques, I've honed the types of foods I ate. I did start very low in the carbs and they'll kind of gradually build it up to a little bit. And I say now around, you know, between 100 and 130 grams a day. I did go like quite cold keto for a while, like you know, less than 50. Um, but I think like finding that sweet spot is something that people don't really understand. They just kind of think think a one size fits all. And um, but there's definitely techniques that need to be addressed to first optimize the fat metabolism and then find the right the right level that works for you to get the best from high density and low. Okay, well let's just cut to the chase. Why, in your opinion, is this low carb, train low, race high approach so crucial to long distance triathlon performance? Why? Why? We well, I mean, well, because we we have an imp we have we only have a limited amount of fuel in terms of carbohydrate. So, and at the end of the day. Ironman triathlon, it's about the person who preserves what we call endogenous stores of carbohydrates, so what's internal. Um, so if we have a good fat burning metabolism, it means that we're not tapping into those. And once those once those supplies are good done, that's it. We hit the wall, we we don't, you know, we don't finish the race, we really slow down. So um, and that's the main reason. Like we have 40,000 calories of fat available to us, and it's not a case that they're not there. It's the case that we can't access them. So it's, the, the trick is to just be able to access them around the Ironman intensity. So what you're saying, and we see this in Ironman, don't we? If you go and you've been doing them, I've been watching more yeah, than yeah. you have, but if you stand yeah. on the sidelines of Ironman, 
then you see a good deal of the field. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, blow at the yeah. wall. Um, usually, through the bike. Yeah, usually about 40 k to go from the bike, and yeah. then it's, a, it's 140, 160 k. Yeah. And then there's another whole group that managed to finish the bike, but early into the run, yeah. they've done as well, and they're down to the shuttle. And, and this is the point: is that you know, function like. Traditional nutrition that is guaranteed that well that is promoted to endurance athletes is carb, 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 eat carbs in training, eat carbs to recover, and it's totally wrong because it's meant that all these people are so in enabled to access their sores is that they get upset stomachs because they have to take on so much carbohydrate, they hit the wall regularly, and also they struggle to make race weight. You see, like the average triathlete, um, lots of the average triathletes who are running down the you know, running in the marathon, the, the same shape as your normal person in every day, right? Lots of them, so and I think that's a real problem. Yeah, that's always struck me as, a, as something that's unusual. You've got, besides the, the pros and the first very small group coming under that 9.30 area or maybe 10 hours, after that, yeah, the groups coming in basically resemble the general population, yeah, which exactly. is half over the way they're obese. And those, and those people will be, um, They'll be training. They'll yeah. be training 15, 20 hours a week. You know, and it's just—it's it, almost—it's um, quite upsetting to to think that they're doing all that. They train all these, all these sacrifices with the family, all these sacrifices with the hours, and then they just go there and don't have a great day. And um, it's not nice for anyone. So, so what we're saying is that here's a method that can get you in shape. Yep. It means you can enjoy the day. Yep. It means you can perform better than you otherwise would. Yeah. It means you can go strong all day. And all it requires is some shifts in nutrition. Yeah. And some shifts in training. Yeah, shifts in training, shifts in nutrition in a methodical and smart manner. So, I mean, the good thing is that we can actually model. I mean, we know we we can model this in the lab. So we can take me, for example, and we can measure my fat oxidation, and we can take someone um, who who hasn't got a good fat loss station and we can model exactly when they're going to blow up and we actually did that in a case study that we can that I could show people right now. Well let's have a look at that. Let's have a look. Okay Grant, here we go. So here's the case study example. Um, so what we did is we took um, took this an athlete who's called Matt Matt, Matt who um, he gave permission for this so yep. he's, he's fully aware. Um, so two is, is him and then me. The really cool thing about um, the two of us is that we're actually very similar. We were the exact same weight and we are also the exact same VO2 max. So VO2 max is, the, is really, it's a really good indicator of aerobic fitness. So, so, so anyway, the fitter you are, the higher your VO2 max pretty right. much. So you've, you've put them in the lab, yep. you've put them on the bike, yep. and you've stepped them through a test with, with uh, the whole gas exchange. Yep. On the yeah, so he wore a mask that people may have seen on TV a lot, like a mask that, will me that basically measures expired carbon dioxide and VO2. And through those measures, we can actually uh, measure um, well, obviously the VO2 and the, uh, the VO2 in the volume of carbon dioxide, but we can also look at what their, his fat metabolism is and his carbohydrate metabolism is. So me and him did exactly the same test. We both started at 130 watts and we went all the way up to uh, 380 watts, and that was every four minutes. Right. So we went so all the way through. Solid test. Solid test, yeah. And you know you're exercising. Yeah. But the beautiful thing about this test is we can see at each of those intensities how much fat you're burning fuel. Yeah. Hydrate your exactly. And they can tell us, we can model about it, how you're going and all. Yeah, we can, we can model at a given power, at a given, run, run, at a given intensity, how much fuel you're going to need to use in terms of fat and carbohydrates, knowing that the carbohydrates are limited in their supply. Okay. Well, let's have a look at how it went. So, so you can see we're quite similar VO2, quite similar in the body weight. And even, so what we can see here is the, our VO2 in liters per minute all the way through the stage all the way through each step of the test. So you can see we start at close to 100 watts and we finish at close to 400. Um, I'm in the blue, Matt's in the, in the red, so we're pretty, we're pretty much identical. Um, so the big question is then, what is the, what is the difference between the two of us? Um, and as you can see here, it's, in, it's all in carbohydrate and fat oxidation. So what the red lines show is the uses of fat as a fuel up here, yeah. and then and the blue line shows what the use, the use of carbohydrate is a fuel. And you can see, for me, even as I get up towards past 300 watts, I'm still, at 300 watts, I'm still using mostly fat as a fuel. So if you consider that my Ironman intensity is around here, you know, a good proportion of my, like 66% of my fuel is coming from fat. Whereas it's hardly anything from carbohydrate. Hardly anything from carbohydrate, so that means I'm preserving that. that and, and, and Matt? 
And Matt, on the other hand, you can see he's the complete opposite. As soon as he even crosses 130 watts, he's going straight into the carbohydrates. Um, and he's using carbohydrates all the way. So when he gets towards this, he's like, you know, just pretty much all carb. Um, and he's really beating into those so, replies. So that's, that's a profound difference, isn't it? We've got two almost identical athletes, uh, body weight, power, output, VO2. Yeah. But the fuel they use to achieve that yeah. is profoundly different. So, so and that's going to result in a profound difference. In people e exactly. And not only is, um, not only is uh, my fat oxidation Higher, I also do it at a much higher wattage. So I, my, my highest peak hot staging comes at 270 watts, whereas Matt comes at 135 watts. So that's another diagram you can see at 270 watts then the red is all fat, the, the, um, the blue is all carbohydrate. You can see that Matt is just a tiny little bit of fat at the top there at 270 watts. And what's this going to mean across the whole line? Well that's what we can talk about right now. So what we can do then is, knowing these values, we can actually model, um, model the what's going to happen to Matt if he tried to do... So basically we modelled my current performance. So what we did in the model is we put in the exact number of carbs that I took during the race. And to give Matt the benefit of the doubt, we took, uh, we gave him 60 grams per hour, so basically 20 grams every 20 grams every 20 minutes, so a little bit more than me. I was more like 20. And during the marathon, I only had 110 grams during the marathon. We gave Matt 20 grams all the way through, which is very unlikely to happen. Um, and then we put Matt at the same power and speeds as I did and we just um, guessed normal economy values and through research. And you can see, so this is the internal carbohydrate stores of Matt and myself. I'm in the blue. Um, so the swim, you can see the swims so up you, here. You start off somewhere. Yeah, we started, we started at the exact same point. So Matt's just under here. We were on the same point, 800 grams. So this is the swim. We come to here. Yeah. Obviously my fat oxidation is better, so I don't use as much carb. And then throughout the race, you can see um, that this is the swim section, this is the bike, and you can see how quickly Matt's carbohydrate stores are coming down on that slope compared to mine. Um, and this is the run section. So Matt's setting ground zero towards the end of the bike. Towards the end of the bike, yeah. So this is the energy lab in the Kona, Kona Ironman. Yep. Um, so you can see I'm still running through the energy lab and I'm still pretty high on the energy stores there. But I'm getting, I'm getting close towards the end, but as you would hope that would be achieved. But whereas Matt, this is around the scenic drive on the way back on the Kona, on the Queen K, and he's pretty much his day's done. Pretty he's much not there. Going, he's not going on the run. He's, he's really well, he, yeah, he's having a nice walk. Pretty much. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, and um, and this is just a video of me um, running the last. Um, this is the last two miles of the race in Kona, and you can see I'm still moving reasonably well at this point. And you're running about four minutes per. Point. Yeah, this was a 355k coming down to the bottom of the hill um, before yep. you climb back up to Palani. So you can see I'm still moving. And what's quite interesting is that we actually um, modelled this as well and I put my position within the top 12 male pros um, throughout the course of the marathon for all yep. the splits. And you can see that by the, you know, I start a little bit, so start a little bit hot in the first pair, got a bit excited, but then I settled in and you see I'm in 10th place, 8th place, 8th place, 6th place, then I'm all like 5th, but by the time I get to the, um, the 35k mark, because it was only really Patrick Langer who was actually running faster than me. And he won the whole race. And he won the whole race, so, you know, so it's just... Another you didn't slow down I during that run? Didn't, no, I didn't slow down. It wasn't a case of me getting faster, it was I didn't slow down. And other people did because my, because my energy levels weren't being reduced. Right, so it's, it's, so it's, it's as simple as that at the end of the day, isn't it? We're, we're in a situation where because you're burning primarily fat and you've trained yourself to do that, both through your training and nutrition, yep. that you've got a substantive performance advantage. Exactly. And, and it's as simple as that. Yeah, yep. and, and the really cool thing is it, it can be trained but what, and also, it, if it's not trained, it can be neglected. Yeah. And it's just like, um, and I look at fat oxidation as a tool that needs to be trained. Just like we train thresholds, just like we train VO2 max, just like we train our speed. Having that as part of your training regime is absolutely critical. So what are you trying to achieve in long distance triathlon 101 and enduro IQ? So I think there's a lot of information out there at the moment in terms of low carb performance. And you know, there's, it's quite a um, sensitive area as well. Um, but what I think what's lacking is people don't really understand it. No one's been there from a coaching perspective, from a science perspective, and from an athlete perspective. We don't really know how to practically apply it. Yeah. And so what we're trying to achieve is we're trying to give people, uh, actually teach them how you can actually apply this within training for a long distance triathlon, how it can actually work for you. So 
you're going to get involved in this course and you're going to see why you do it and but more importantly how you do it exactly yeah so so i guess all the courses like i always like to think of this what so what now what so the what in this case would be um low carb performance and the the um so what is but okay, so why is it even important? So just like we've talked now, hopefully some of the people who watch this will be convinced that it is important, but you know, you're also going to convince them why it's important from a health perspective and why it's important from a, um, from a weight perspective. Mm -hmm. And then after people are convinced in the so what, there'll be the now what. And that's the point that, where people will get the most benefit and we will show them how to actually practically apply this to training and um, what you can actually do to really make those inroads. Right, and Enduro IQ is not just looking at nutrition, you've got a whole suite of, of swag uh, up your sleeve here for, for athletes and coaches to think about it. Tell me a bit about that. Yeah, yeah that's the plan. Um, so the reason I went with LDT 101, which is low carb performance, is because um, after Kona, this is the thing that everyone was asking me about. You know, I got so many questions about how I do it, what's my race yeah. nutrition. But for me, like, I'm not saying, I don't really think that's my thing. I think I'm actually better at training programs, that's what I've done all my life. Yeah. Like, training programs for rowing, training programs for kayak, training programs for sailing, whatever you want to call it, like that's that's my thing. So um, using some of those techniques, we're going to have some other modules that might be on training and periodization, um, racing in the heat, just basically using scientific knowledge. Racing, racing itself. Yeah. So there's a whole suite coming up for, for people who want to do well yeah. uh, and get the most out of yeah. themselves. Athletes, I think, I think it's applicable to athletes and coaches who really want to, you know, who really want to um, you know, if you're, if you're that person who's spending, you know, $300 on a pair of running shoes, I think this is the course for you. Yes. So, so in your opinion, could you have achieved, what, where would you be now if you hadn't gone down this low carb route? Would you, where would you be in your Ironman racing? This, oh, well, there's no way I would have achieved what I would have achieved. I mean, I'm not going to say that, I don't even want to sit here and say that the low carb approach is everything. Like, I obviously had a really good training program, but it's, you can't, there is no, it's, everything has to be together for, for something to work, for something it has to be a holistic approach and that's what it gives you. Yeah. Um, you know, I, might, I may have finished in the top, um, you know, I may have won my age group in Kona, but I would never have broken the course record and I would never have been on that trajectory that I got from that. And with the ethics that you coach now, you coach several very high profile athletes, so you use these approaches with them? Um, variations of the approach of these approaches, yeah. Like um, we, we talk about a lot about in the courses, it's not necessarily a low carb diet all the time. I think lower carb definitely, but also specific sessions where you can really aim to push that fat oxidation, which is the critical thing you, you're going to do. So, but it's different. That's why we, we really go into this individual approach. Like age group is a different to pros because pros can train 20 30 hours a week, and age group can't. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, different different horses for different courses, so to speak.